So this session will be recorded. So welcome again, welcome everyone. We will invite you to open your camera eventually if you're able to settle down and, and be in a comfortable position to listen to the conference tonight. I will just share with you as we have a couple of people still connecting with the audio. Um, I see that all your microphones are already closed, so that's perfect. I just want to remind you that the place to uh, close your mic is right here. When you are ready, we will invite you to open your camera. So the second little icon and uh, when you're ready, will be cool to see you. So please open your camera. Also, at the end of the presentation tonight, we will take some questions. Um, so you can either, when we will be there, write them in the chat here where it's written Converser if you have a French version or chat if you have an English version. So please um, write down your question in the chat. You can also um, raise your hand. So in the reaction button, there's a little place where you can press um, to um, right here. So where it's written reaction. So leve la main or raise your hand is right under that little reaction button. Maybe another interesting uh, thing to know if you want to see uh, the presenter tonight, we have the chance to have with us um, Monsieur Dejean. So if you want to see him like all using all the big screen, you can click on top here. And I think my version is in French though, but in the section affichage, I'm not sure how it's written in English, you can click to see intervenant or speaker, and that will um, show you only the person speaking. Um, so voila for, um, and also, as you saw, the session is recorded. So <laughs> we said smile, you are recorded just to let you know that we are recording everything. So voila, and make sure you can also react if you want, give us some impression. Uh, one other thing I'm thinking is if you want, you can rename yourself. So when you see your camera, you see your own camera, there's three little dots beside your camera. If you click on it, you have the opportunity to rename yourself. Like you can see, I'm using my full name or make sure that what is written under your face or your camera is the way you would like us to call you if ever you have a question to ask. Okay, um, so I will officially um, start and go to my next um, page. So, so I want to wish you officially welcome. Welcome to that public lecture. Tonight we'll have the chance to hear uh, Frédéric Desjean that is here with us already. So you can just uh, say hi. Bonjour, bonsoir. <laughs> Good. And we will hear this public lectures uh, tonight will be on the synagogues of the Hasidic communities in Outremont and Myland. And we have two hours schedule. My name is Marie-Josée Laroux and it's a pleasure to be here with you tonight. We will start in just a couple of minutes with the opening remarks. Uh, and just before we start, I want to remind you if you are now ready, please do like Earl and open your camera, make sure we can connect with you and have the impression that we are maybe here in the same room. Um, yeah, so we invite you, thank you. So we have Diane uh, that open her camera, Earl. Uh, so we invite you to do the same. Hi, good night. Parfait. Okay, Marie-Claude, would you be ready for us um, to move to the presentation? So I would go to uh, the presentation of the plan that we have organized for you tonight. So we will start with just a quick opening remark. Uh, we have Marie-Claude Leblanc, um, that is the director uh, borough uh, that will be here tonight, or the borough director of Outremont. Then uh, I will explain you the rules of the game and we will after go into uh, the conference of uh, Monsieur Dejean. Um, and then we have uh, at the end a moment schedule for questions. So questions period. And then we'll end with a short conclusion. So that's what we have um, for tonight. So yeah, we'll invite you to keep your microphone closed during the presentation. And if you are ready, uh, Marie-Claude, I would like to invite you to give us a couple of words for the opening remarks. Thank you, Marie-Josée. Um, 
I will be short and brief. Uh, a table of uh, concertation de bon voisinage was set up last year uh, to support the work of our, of our table. Uh, the borough commissioned uh, two studies, uh, one with Monsieur Dejean that you will hear uh, tonight and another one with uh, Mrs. Gaddy uh, who will be presenting uh, next week on March uh, 27th. Um, <laughs> I think that somebody hasn't <laughs> muted uh, his, uh, his mic. Um, so another study from um, Mrs. Gaddy on acidim and non-acidim in Outremont and Milan using and sharing public spaces. So that will be uh, for next week. So again, uh, welcome and enjoy uh, the conference of Monsieur Dejean and thank you for being here tonight. Thank you very much. Um, so I just want to remind you again the rules or the main features of Zoom, uh, because a couple of people just join in. I see that there's a couple of people still trying to log in and connecting with the audio. Uh, as you do so, please make sure that you mute um, your microphone. So just a couple of notes again, uh, make sure that you name yourself the way you would like us to talk to you or to um, give you uh, the chance to speak later on if you want. So the way to do that, you will simply go um, where you see your own picture. There's three little dots. Click on those dots and then you will see the option rename. So if you want, you can make sure to rename yourself so we can call you uh, the name you would like to be called tonight. So that is a little option. Um, then, of course, like I said, mute your microphone when you join. We will invite you to open it um, when it's time to ask uh, questions. Um, we also invite you to open your camera so we can see you. It's much more fun for myself and for uh, Monsieur Dejean to be able to see who we are talking to. So we invite you to open your camera. And uh, maybe another thing to keep in mind, uh, the chat button is here. If you want to ask questions, Dr. Dejean will take the questions at the end uh, so you can write them in the chat at, towards the end of the conference. Um, you can also react if you really like something, you can give some thumbs up. And this is where, uh, towards the end, if you want to ask questions, you can raise your hand. We'll remind you all that in case you forget. And once again, this session is recorded. A couple of rules uh, for the night. Uh, so during the conference, we just said it, close your mic, open your camera. Try to stay present as much as you can, listen carefully uh, to the best of your ability. And it's best for you to close like phones, app, anything that could become a distraction. Uh, and then other thing to keep in mind, when we will be doing the question period, we will invite you to raise your hand um, and to ask one question at the time, because maybe we'll have a lot of people tonight wanting to ask questions. Uh, be brief so we can take advantage of hearing everyone's idea and we also want to remind you to be open to differences and to make sure that you speak calmly and respectfully um, and we want to remind you that the objectives are tonight is to ask for a clarification question i will remind you just beforehand when it will be time to present donc monsieur Dejean. Would you be ready? I will just stop my uh, presentation. I see that there's already some messages uh, in the chat. Yes, Marie, uh, la rencontre sera en anglais ce soir. Elle a déjà été présentée en français, so tonight it's planned to be in English. So if you have some questions, we can answer them in French. Um, but the presentation is planned to be uh, in French, uh, in English, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> Donc, um, à votre tour maintenant, uh, Donc, Dr. Frédéric Desjean, je vous laisse la parole. Your turn. Make sure you open your mic. I'm sorry, I close everyone's mic, so you have to reopen it. Thank you. So now it's open. And yes. In theory, you should listen to me. Okay. So thank I share my screen with you. So good evening to everyone. And uh, thank you for, for your virtual participation to, to, to the presentation of the report. Uh, a report I recently submitted to, to the Bureau of Outremont. So let's start with the introduction. Uh, it doesn't, okay, excuse me. Okay, yeah. 
So speaking of synagogues is not an easy task in Outremont and Le Myland, even from the social sciences perspective. And it is my perspective as an academics. It is not an easy reason for different reasons. And there are three main reasons. First, talking about or studying synagogues is not only dealing with the place of worship issue in which was it, what is at stake will be exclusively religious zoning and urban planning issues. In fact, synagogues embody in everyday life a broader issue which is in French, le vivre ensemble or living together in English. In an article published almost 20 years ago, commenting a superior court decision about the Hérouve in Outremont, the sociologist Valérie Stoker wrote, and there is a quote uh, on, the po in the po on the slide, while Hérouve, while Hérouve disputes typically have an official focus on legal or aesthetic issues, these issues are often a smoke screen for deeper community conflict. This explains why many requests for Eruvim, including several on the island of Montreal, have been granted with no controversy. Eruv requests are contested in locations already marked by ethnic, religious, cultural, and other tensions, and where an established and therefore correct community image is felt to be undermined by the Eruv's presence. I think that in this quote, we could replace the word Eruv by the word synagogue, and it would still make sense. The interviews we conducted for this research revealed that synagogues are a smokescreen behind which lies the overarching issue of living together in a common space. A second difficulty stems from the process of polarization by which two camps or two sides gradually moved away from each other during the recent years. And since the very moment I accepted to conduct the, the research, my concern was to avoid the trap of the partisan position. I perfectly know that because the research was partly initiated by the borough, some people were convinced that my perspective was flawed and that my report would be the scientific approval of a lenient position toward the Hasidic communities in Outremont. I guess that among Hasidic communities, some people held the opposite perspective. Nevertheless, I did my best to offer a balanced assessment of the situation, and I can say that the report is well balanced uh, with this respect. Finally, synagogues have to be analyzed at three levels or from three perspectives, which sometimes I'm on mute. Okay. Désolé, M. Dejan, c'est ma faute. Je voulais mettre quelqu'un en sourdine et j'ai mis le vote par erreur. Désolé. No problem. OK, so we have to analyze the issue of synagogues from three perspectives. The perspective of the Hasidic communities members for whom, for whom synagogues are more than places, places of worship, but synagogues are the key component of the social life as they are places where they pray, they study, and more generally socialize. There is the perspective of the Bobo, whose concern is to keep balance between the different needs of the, of the, of the different communities inhabiting the Bobo of Outremont. And finally, at a last level, synagogues don't let non-Hasidic citizens un unconcerned as the synagogues have impact and consequences on their everyday life. Since 1988 and what became l'affaire d'Outremont, some people mobilized against the opening of new synagogues, not so much because they consider that Hasidic communities should not have places of worship where together, but rather because they don't want to live with what they see as urban nuisances. In my presentation, I, I will not exactly repeat what is in the report, but I would like to emphasize some of the elements which, from my point of view, are important to have a better understanding of the situation. 
So you can see on my, uh, okay. You can see the, how my presentation will be organized. It will be organized in four parts and I hope I don't, I, I won't be too long. So I will start with the first, okay, with the first part, the presence of the Hasidic communities in Outremont and the link between the demographic uh, figures and the geography of synagogues uh, in Outremont and Mailand. So you probably know that the presence of Hasidic communities in Montreal is part of a movement of rebirth of Hasidim in the post-Second World War context. North America, especially New York, became the preeminent center of Hasidic life outside Israel. And as it is explained in the book, Hasidism, a new history published three years ago, the land of promise became the locus the locus of home Hasidism's golden age, eclipsing in numbers and quality anything in its past. In size, in the no number of institutions, political influence and reach, Hasidic life became firmly established in the very place no one had, no one had expected it to flourish. The data and the figures I discuss now and that you will find in the report are from a demographic study made by Charles Shah in uh, 2020, two years ago. In this study, Shah explained that the most important growth between uh, 2014 and uh, 2019 was uh, the Vishnitz and some other small communities, which sometimes are composed of few families. This growth has consequences on the need for new synagogues as some of these communities have the desire to open their own synagogue. In 2016, Outremont had a population of about 20, 24,000 persons. Among them, 22% are members of Hasidic communities. 20 years ago, the borough had a population of 23,000 and the Hasidic communities were estimated to represent 15% of the population. If we go back in the past, in a book chapter published in 1996, uh, Shana, Shana Van Prague, a professor at McGill University wrote, most Hasidic Jews in Montreal, indeed 3,000 of the 4,000 live in Outremont comprising between 11 and 15% of the population of Outremont, the Hasidim belong primarily to the Satmar and Bels communities. Finally, Pierre Antil estimates that in 1988, when l'affaire d'Outremont happened, the Hasidim represented about 12% of the population in Outremont. So let's see now, uh, uh, the link between the demographic aspect and the current geography of synagogues in Outremont and the Mainland. To understand the evolution of the geography of the synagogues in Outremont and in the Mainland, it is evident that demographic growth must be, must, be took, must be took in account. Nevertheless, the institutional fragmentation of Hasidic world should not be forgot. When members of a specific community are enough, they try to open their own synagogue. During an interview, a representative explained that I feel much more comfortable in a place that goes with my customs, with my way of praying. During the research, we made interviews with representatives of small Hasidic communities in Outremont and the Myland. And uh, but, uh, two of Désolée, je pense qu'on a encore fermé votre micro. Uh, it's open again. C'est des gens sans faire exprès, je suis désolée. These, two, these, uh, these representatives explained that their communities leave a situation of what I called in a previous research, a special precarity. So they have, so, uh, they have to constantly adapt to a context they cannot control. 
For instance, one of these little Hasidic community in the Myland gathers for the Shabbat in a yeshiva, and another community rent every week a premises to a Greek community center. Um, in the, if, you, if you have the report, you can download it um, uh, on the internet. Uh, I try to, to establish a map of the synagogue in uh, Outremont and Le Mainland. At the end, I identify in Outremont five synagogues and one place uh, with which users were not clear when we conducted, conducted the interviews. In the report, I focus on the case of this place, which is on Saviator. When I talk to public servants working for the urban planning department in Outremont, they explained to me that they did not know how to consider it. They mentioned that they received complaints from citizens living close to this place. One public, one public servant told me, the, the quotation is in French, on comprend que c'est un bâtiment qui ne démontre pas un usage résidentiel typique. On n'a pas une grande cuisine, la salle familiale est très grande et il y a comme un mur qui a été soufflé devant les fenêtres avec un espèce de lutrin, ce qui donnerait l'impression que l'on peut recevoir des gens et qu'il pourrait y avoir des cérémonies à l'intérieur de ce bâtiment. Mais l'aménagement, c'est une chose, mais ce n'est pas assez fort pour qu'on puisse dire, hors de tout doute, que c'est un lieu de culte. What I wanted to show with this, with this quote that uh, there is an issue for the public, for the person outside their acidic communities because they don't know how to identify uh, and to determine if a place is a, uh, a place of worship or not. Synagogues have the characteristic, uh, synagogues have the characteristic of being both geographically and socially central to Hasidic communities. The synagogue lie at the, at the heart of residential strategies and are key elements in the social life of, of Hasidim. That's why something always happens in the synagogue. One representative explained in uh, an interview, it's a synagogue is a place we use on a daily basis. It's not something we use only on Sunday for one hour between 10 or 11 o'clock. There is life in this place every day for 18 hours, something you can see with your own eyes. In a famous book, Synagogue Life, the sociologist Samuel Heilman explained that synagogue should not be seen uniquely as a place of worship, a place dedicated exclusively for, for religious activities. On the contrary, synagogues are places for social life at large. It is a place where people pray, study, share a coffee, and socialize. In a book chapter published in 2019, Stephen Lapidus and William Shafir focus on the capacity of Hasidic communities to preserve their traditions and their way of life, both cultivating spatial propinquity and social distance. They borrow the notion of institutional completeness from an American sociologist, Raymond Broughton. The notion of institutional completeness refers to the capacity of a group to offer its members the most complete range of services possible, helping them to preserve the group's identity. Raymond Broughton wrote uh, in an article published in 1964, in which he explained the notion of institutional completeness. The institutional completeness will be at its extreme whenever the ethnic community could perform all the services required by its members. From this point of view, the synagogues constitute the cornerstone of the social community organization of the various Hasidic communities in Outremont and the Myland. They are simultaneously places of prayer, study, and socializing. The result is that for the members of the communities, not having places of worship is not just an irritant, but more a major obstacle. 
hence the expression heard in interviews, no synagogue, no life. So we can see now the issues and the needs shared by the representative and the leaders we met during the research. During the interviews, representatives and leaders expressed major concerns about the lack of space and the disrespect of numerous premises. premises pardon, sorry. One, one representative explained that his community count about 200 men and then the community is growing. The consequence of this growth is that premises are too small and women participate, participate to the activities on rare occasions. Moreover, some members prefer to pray during the week in other synagogues in the neighborhood. From the perspective of this representative, this situation is not sus sustainable and the community will have to find something else. During the interviews, representatives and leaders expressed some ideas and suggestions. Um, first, to open new synagogues, which location fits with where the community members live. To close the cur current synagogue and to move in larger premises catering the needs of the community. That's exactly what the Belt community recently did when they bought a former church at the intersection of Hutchison Street and Saviator. Another solution will be to extend an existing synagogue. In theory, this is something quite simple to do. But events in the past showed th that such operation raised, raised controversies, especially with non-Hasidic residents. That's exactly what happened a few years ago in 2011, when the Bobover community decided to enlarge the gate of David synagogue. One representative explained, right now, only if we are gonna expand from the back, we would like to have a bigger place, but we, we would not like to move the place. We would like to expand the place. Size of the premises is one thing, but decency and convenience is another important issue. Representatives explain that some of their members more, are more willing to attend other synagogues in order to feel more comfortable. Let's see now in the second part, uh, what I call a religious zoning issue. As you probably know, if you want to start an activity, you have to check if uh, this activity is authorized in the area you intend to locate. And if that's the case, you have to get the permit d'occupation in French, the occupancy permit related to your activity. So uh, it appears in the research and that's and uh, it's a thing that you can see in the report uh, that um, uh, the synagogues identified uh, some of them got an occupancy for for uh, an occupancy permit for religious activities whereas other got a permit for community and social activities such a situation is common in Montreal, especially for minority religious communities. It is made possible by the, fact, by the fact that it is very difficult for a borough to make a clear distinction between a religious activity and a social or a cultural activity. A public servant in uh, Le Plateau Mont-Royal explained to me that, pour nous, Faire la démarcation entre un centre communautaire et un lieu de culte, sincèrement, ce n'est pas facile. Surtout euh, lorsqu'on ne connaît pas les pratiques. The way, uh, borough, uh, the way the borough conceives religious activities results from a conception of religious zoning embedded in an implicit Christian conception of what religion and what a place of worship are. 
a public servant explained to me in an interview, le zonage a été conçu avec l'idée que les lieux de culte sont des lieux de rassemblement où l'on va une fois par semaine, peut-être deux. On transpose un type d'usage sur un autre lieu de culte avec des pratiques différentes que l'on comprend plus ou moins bien. C'est sûr que ce n'est pas parfait. This point is very important and was recently addressed by a trend in urban studies and urban planning known as multicultural planning, especially developed in Great Britain and in Canada. One, one of the concerns of the multicultural planning movement was to show that, that planning is never a value-free activity, only guided by objective criteria, but is often underpinned by values and cultural norms. Consequently, for instance, in the field of religion, some groups are disadvantaged because the way they practice their religion doesn't fit with the dominant conception of what religion, of uh, the dominant conception of religion. So we can see now what the representative and the leaders think of the religious zoning and what were, what were their suggestions. If the representatives whom synagogues are considered as illegal are aware of this situation, they explained that their communities don't really have the choice to proceed otherwise as they are not able to find premises fitting their needs. That, uh, that's why some communities prefer to stay unnoticed or to ask permit for activities other than religious activities. From their perspective, not complying with the law doesn't result of a deliberate choice, but is more the consequence that current bylaw don't fit with the needs of their communities. If the representative we met all agreed to criticize the current bylaws and religious zoning, especially in Outremont, they gave different explanations. For some of them, current religious zoning reflects, reflects the lack of knowledge about the community's needs and the, the, the realities of the Hasidic communities. This lack of knowledge will find its origin in two elements. First, a conception of the place of worship based on the Christian model. Second, the fact that Quebec as a secularized society marginalize the role of religious institutions in public life. Another interpretation sees, sees the current bylaw as directly aimed at the Hasidic communities. For one representative we met, these bylaws were directly motivated by the fear of the Francophone majority of losing their territory. Another representative said simply, it is basically racism underneath the law. Interviews with representatives finished with a question on the potential solutions representative would like to share with the city officials. So you can see uh, on, the power, on the slide the different suggestions we heard in the interviews. Um, first, as most of the synagogues opened in the last years on Park Avenue, representative suggested that the Plateau Mont Royal should, should, could authorize places of worship on Park Avenue between Bernard and Van Orne. It is interesting to note that some residents and non racidic residents made a similar suggestion. On the contrary, some representatives said that Park Avenue was not a long-term solution. One representative explained to us, I think that they should go over the numbers, perhaps of people, and see where the Jew Jewish community is concentrated and try to give them availability of small places of house of worship where they can legally go. What is important is not so much the number of synagogues than their repartition in the space. 
we mentioned in the report that synagogues should be analyzed as a key element in articulation with where the members lie, uh, lies. It means that new synagogues should reflect the evolution of where Sidim live. For instance, one representative explained that some families are now located on Van Horn and streets beyond the traditional Hutchison, Kerb, and Du Rocher. Uh, the previous point invites us not to consider all synagogues on the same model, but to think of different sizes according to the function, the, to their function. Given the simplicity of the facilities required by the prayer rooms, it will be possible to open small places that serve people living nearby. It is also in the spirit of better serving members of different communities that some leaders have initiated synagogues that have been described in some interviews as non-denominational synagogue since they are not attached to any particular community. I think that uh, this is the case of the future synagogue at the intersection of Bernard and Champagneur. For some leaders, this type of synagogue is an avenue to be explored in the years to come, as it allows, it allows them to serve households that cannot always get to their community synagogue. It is in this spirit that the synagogue at the intersection of Bernard and Champagneur uh, will open its doors. For some, uh, for some of the people we met in the interviews, the most important thing may not be the opening of new synagogues, but rather to encourage the expansion of existing, existing synagogues. For instance, a representative suggested that the bylaw should allow congregations to occupy a building and to, uh, um, excuse me, the, the bylaw should uh, allow congregations that occupy a building to add a floor or to expand into the building directly adjacent to them. One leader suggested that the zoning bylaw should allow buildings adjacent to places of worship to be associated with religious institutions. Another, another suggestion we, we heard during the interviews is to enhance the value of available land by proposing to combine synagogues with non-religious functions. For example, where there is an outdoor parking lot, why not build a building that combines a ground level parking with a synagogue on the second floor. And to maintain commercial continuity, the idea of allowing places of worship on the second floor was also put forward. And I mentioned that such a practice is widely used in other Montreal boroughs. Finally, another possibility will be the conversion of places of worship mostly Christian in Outremont into synagogues. In fact, religious buildings can be transferred by right to other religious traditions that acquire them. This is what will happen in a few months at the intersection of Saint-Viateur and Hutchison. Let's see now in the third part, how the synagogues affect uh, the lives of non hasidic residents. Uh, during the research, we made uh, about 20 interviews with non hasidic residents living in Outremont and in the Myland. While the synagogues are primarily of interest to, to their users, they can also have an impact on the da daily lives of non hasidic residents whose homes are located near a place of prayer. I opened uh, this section of, the uh, of my presentation with a quote from the former mayor of the Plateau Mont-Royal, Luc Ferrandez, quotation which encapsulates what is at stake. 
il y a un paquet de petites nuisances et de petits désagréments qui peuvent hérisser les voisins. C'est ça qu'il faut gérer, pas le droit des communautés religieuses de s'installer sur le territoire. Il faut gérer des nuisances comme on gérerait n'importe quel type de commerce. I'd like to make, I'd like to make two comments uh, on this quote. First, it is a call to intervene on the urban consequences of the religious activities and not the religious activities as such. So there is no need to discuss freedom of religion. The issues are more the activities held in these places. In this way, what the mayor said was just a brief remind of the municipal law. Second, relationships between the synagogue and non-Racidic residents take place in a broader debate on good neighborly relations characterized by the search for a precarious balance between different, way of the different waves of life. This notion of good neighborly relations, bonne relation de voisinage, has a link with the famous expression vivre ensemble, living together, frequently invoked in the last years. Uh, good neighborly relations owns a normative di dimension. It assumes that people who live in the same space share some fundamental norms and values. Moreover, it owns a contractual dimension, most of the time implicit, in which people are ready to change the behavior, their behavior if others accept the game. The professor Shona Van Praag from uh, McGill University explains that à l'intérieur de notre espace personnel, pardon, chacun de nous peut vivre comme bon lui semble. Cependant, cette liberté est limitée par le fait que nous vivons à proximité d'autres personnes. Finally, in this quote, there is the expression « paquet de petites nuisances » or in English uh, « a bundle of little nuisances, to which some people react emotionally. These little nuisances deserve to be analyzed and not automatically rejected as illegitimate. During the research, I analyzed articles published in French speaking newspaper, La Presse, Le Devoir and Le Journal de Montréal, uh, Uh, from 1988 to, uh, uh, to uh, 2020. It appears in these articles that the synagogues are definitely the focus point of many controversies, as for instance, the famous L'Affaire d'Outremont in 1988. But L'Affaire d'Outremont was just the first of a very long series of other controversies uh, from 1988. Uh, 88 to, uh, to these days. In, in 1988, a non racidic resident explained to a journalist that, and this is a quote on the screen, uh, it is, I think, a very important quote. So the, the resident was talking about the uh, acidic, um, acidic members. Ils sont dérangeants, envahissants, ennuyants. Et en plus, ils ne nous regardent même pas. Outremont ne nous appartient si peu, et si, pour encore un, un peu de temps, quelques-uns se croient encore chez eux, tant mieux. Mais très bientôt, Outremont ne nous appartient plus. So, this quote, I have to confess, this quote is a little bit disturbing, but I think that even if it was uh, more than 30 years ago, it's uh, quite contemporary. In this quote, we can hear the fear of feeling oneself as a stranger in one's own neighborhood, which is very strong, as if Hasidic communities were not entitled to live in Outremont. In the, uh, during the interviews with the uh, non-Hasidic uh, non uh, residents, They mention nuisances, uh, they mention different kinds of nuisances. Uh, first, I'd like to, to remind you that um, 
there is an official definition of what a nuisance, uh, a nuisance in French, nuisance is uh, for the Ministry of Municipal Affairs. You can find this definition on uh, an official website of the Quebec government. La première caractéristique d'une nuisance, and I, I didn't find an English version of this definition, so I'm sorry. La première caractéristique d'une nuisance est d'entraîner de graves inconvénients ou de porter atteinte soit à la santé publique, soit au bien-être général d'une partie ou de toute la collectivité. Le terme nuisance peut englober toute une gamme de situations, odeurs, bruit, poussière, émanations, etc. Le règlement sur les nuisances doit donc définir comme nuisance des phénomènes sérieux et non éphémères. With this quote, we see that determining a nuisance is not an exact science and each situation has to be analyzed individually with specific criteria. Some nuisances are collectively accepted, are, are collectively accepted as such and are not subject of debate or discussion. For instance, the noise provoked by plane in a residential sector close to an airport. Everybody in the sector uh, agree to consider that the noise of a plane is a nuisance. Nevertheless, most of the time, people don't experience situation the same way. So for this research, we, we conducted interviews with about non-racidic residents living in Outremont and the Mal End. They all recognize the right of Hasidic communities to have synagogues. But, but for some of them, and some of them explained that synagogue bring sometimes negative consequences. And from their perspective, these consequences are not addressed by the borough. We can, we can distinguish um, uh, uh, three domains Uh, of these consequences of this uh, of these reasons. The first is the car traffic and the parking. Uh, in a previous mandate, uh, in a previous research for the city of Montreal, I explained that car traffic and parking is perceived by residents as the main source of nuisance, and what happened in Outremont and the Myland is not different of what happened elsewhere in Montreal. A resident who has been living on Jeanne Mans for 40 years explained that 20 years ago, the Comité de la Rue Jeanne Mans took an action when a synagogue on Jeanne Mans decided to expand. From the perspective of uh, this resident, uh, And I, 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 give, I gave a quote of what I heard in the interview. On trouvait qu'il y avait beaucoup de circulation et le double ou triple stationnement était une habitude. Il n'y avait pas encore de piste cyclable sur Jeanne Mans. Quand je stationnais ma voiture et que je la laissais dix minutes devant la maison, il y avait rapidement quelqu'un de garé devant. Alors j'allais à la synagogue. Alors j'allais à la synagogue. Rapidement, quelqu'un sortait pour déplacer sa voiture. In 1999, when the synagogue opened at the intersection of Du Rocher and La Joie, newspapers mentioned similar issues. And uh, in an article published in La Presse in 1999, a resident of uh, non-racidim non resident of Hutchison explained that the seul problem c'est quand ils stationnent en double fil, ils viennent de bloquer la ruelle. Alors, tu es mieux de ne pas être pressé. A second issue is uh, mentioned in the interview uh, is the noise um, linked to the presence of synagogues. In an interview, a resident living on Du Rocher explained to me that, honnêtement, and she was talking about the noise, honnêtement, c'est la raison pour laquelle je veux déménager parce que cela fait beaucoup de bruit et beaucoup de circulation. Quand les hommes sortent de la synagogue certains soirs, ils chantent fort, que ce soit 11h ou minuit. 
For another resident living on Durocher as well, noise is related, related to some holidays, for instance, Sukkot. He explained to me, sur les deux tiers de la largeur de la synagogue, ils ont construit une soucotte ouverte en haut. Je calcule qu'ils peuvent être entre 50 et 80 à l'intérieur. Ce sont des hommes joyeux qui doivent crier leur amour à Dieu et ils font cela à minuit. Cela ne me fait rien que tu fasses ta célébration l'après-midi, mais passé 21 heures, surtout à minuit, cela me fait péter les plans. Another resident on Du Rocher feels a lack of consideration for those who do not celebrate. He explained, on est témoin de tout cela sans malheureusement qu'on ne tienne compte du fait que l'on n'est pas tous obligés de fêter. On peut se lever tôt, parfois je dois me lever à 4 heures du matin pour mon travail. Quand la fête continue jusqu'à minuit ou une heure, cela ne me convient pas. Um, Some of the nuisances mentioned are directly linked to religious activities. And I think it is important to distinguish uh, these nuisances from other nuisances that are indirectly linked to the religious activities. For example, nuisances related to car traffic are not directly related to religious activities, but rather to users of the premises. Another example of indirect nu nu uh, nuisance was reported in an interview. A resident in the Myland on uh, Hutchison Street mentioned, that, mentioned the noise from industrial air conditioners installed on the roof of a synagogue. Um, he explained to me, an appareil de climatisation industrielle a été, a été installé à l'arrière. C'est gros, c'est usagé, et cela a pris une grue pour aller grimper cela. Um, um, maybe a quick... Um, uh, we have people asking if we can translate when the quotation are in French. Um, so I speak French, so I understand that often you explain first and then you give the exact words of that person. But maybe if you can make sure that okay. uh, we have okay. a sense of what it means in English. Okay, Thank you so much. Sure. So in this quote, uh, a resident of uh, Hutchison Street who lives close to a synagogue explained to me that the synagogue um, uh, put um, uh, air conditioning, an, like a big air conditioning. Yeah, an industrial air conditioner directly on the roof of the synagogue, and the roof is right in front of the terrace uh, of the resident. Mm -hmm. And he explained to me that during In, in winter, it's not a problem, but in summer, sometimes in, it's 10 o'clock p.m., sometimes it's almost midnight, and he can hear uh, his, yeah, nice. his windows uh, are open, and he can, uh, he can hear the air conditioning, he is not able to sleep. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Finally, the last, uh, 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 the last uh, uh, element I mentioned in the interviews Uh, was uh, the garbage management. Several residents uh, mentioned the problem of garbage storage near the synagogue. And it was something that uh, I frequently um, heard, du uh, uh, heard during, the, uh, during the interviews. So for many residents, the management of garbage around the synagogues will be all the more problematic in the summer when it is very hot. Nevertheless, uh, some of them mentioned that, that during the two last years, uh, the communities made effort to improve the situation with the garbage management. Finally, uh, I'd like just to address uh, in the last part, uh, the question of the balance uh, or what I call a, a tension between freedom of religion and research of the common good. Uh, if, you, if, you read, uh, if you have read the report, and if you read the report, you will see that uh, the interviews and the court, decision, court decisions analyzed in the report show that the controversies surrounding the opening of synagogues are marked by a fundamental tension between 
the freedom of religion demanded by Hasidic communities and the research of the common good and public interest evoked by elected officials. Mentioning this tension is important because it will undoubtedly be at the heart of discussions in the coming years. Uh, following the 2016 referendum in Outremont, the famous lawyer Julius Gray explained that what is democratic is not necessarily the decision of the majority if this decision impedes the rights of minority. And one representative explained in an interview that we live in a democratic society. It is not only the governance of the majority. Even if the majority decides, there are strong protections for minority groups. During interviews, representatives and leaders of racistic communities insisted on the importance of freedom of religion. From their perspective, a synagogue is conceived as a right and the borough have the responsibility to help them to find premises. And it's true that freedom of religion is one of the fundamental freedoms enshrined in both the 1982 Canadian Charter of, Charter of Rights and Freedoms and Quebec's Charter of Human Rights and Freedoms. For instance, we read in the former document, everyone has the following fundamental freedoms, freedom of conscience and religion. Canadian and Quebec charters are tools to fight discriminations and religion is recognized as a major source of discrimination affected, affecting individuals or groups. The scientific literature interested in how urban planning rules and bylaws may bring about some direct or indirect discrimination show that in recent decades, urban planning was used as a means for hindering religious minorities to get an access to urban space, especially places of worship. In the American context, the sociologist Brian J. Miller explains that uh, with religion often intimately tied to race, ethnicity, and social class, some religious congregations and groups argue denying a new house of worship or significant changes to existing structures is a matter of discrimination. The idea that urban planning rules and bylaws are an important source of discrimination um, was recently clearly denounced by Hasidic leaders in a report submitted at the occasion of the public consultation on racism and systemic discrimination. In this report, the authors contended that, and there is a quote on the, uh, uh, on the screen, in the past, members of the Outremont Borough Council have shown, have shown a serious disregard for constitutional rights in the use of discretionary power. For example, the Council has effectively managed to restrict religious practices related to holidays of Sukkot, Purim, Passover, the, Shab the Sabbath, as well as religious processions in general. Zoning bylaws have been used in an attempt to close a synagogue. Zoning bylaws have been modified to restrict new places of worship on commercial streets. And recently, this resulted in the banning of new places of worship in the entire borough. Although bylaws may be written in neutral terms, they affect the Hasidic community in a disproportionate manner. If in different cases courts, uh, if um, uh, in different, uh, in numerous affairs, the courts note that urban planning bylaws May, may, uh, may have negative outcomes for religious minorities. In some cases, the court also notes that the freedom of religion is not absolute, is not absolute 
but has to be considered in a given situation in which different interests are involved. For instance, and I will give only one, one, one example, in the case of the congregation of the followers of the Rabbi of Bells to strengthen, to, uh, uh, to strengthen Torah uh, versus uh, the city of Valmorin, in which a Lubavitch community wanted to open a synagogue in the, in the Mont Tremblant ski resort, the judge um, wondered if it was enough to invoke the freedom of religion um, if it was enough to invoke the freedom of religion, religion to disregard the application of a municipal bylaw. The court decision drew on a famous Canadian Supreme, Supreme, Supreme Court decision in which the judge wrote, in, the, in this respect, it should be emphasized that not every action will be become summarily unassailable and receive automatic protection under the banner, the banner of freedom of religion. No right, including freedom of religion, is absolute. This is because we live in a society of individuals in which we must always take the rights of others into account. To conclude on this point, I would like to refer to the court decision of the Quebec Superior Court uh, one year ago. You probably remember that some Hasidic communities contested a governmental decree drastically limiting the number of people in a place of worship. And in this de decision, the judge, Chantal Mass, gave reason to the Hasidic communities. Uh, uh, I'm sorry, but the, the the quote of the court decision is in French, and mm -hmm. it's too and complicated to be translated. Okay, uh, maybe we can try just to give a sense so people that don't speak French have a sense of what yeah, is okay. inside this court. In this court decision, the judge uh, gave reason to the Hasidic communities. Nevertheless, if you if you if you read carefully the the judgment, she explained as well that maybe uh, the decision of the government was took because there was a superior interest, which, which was the interest of the Quebec society at large. Mm -hmm. so she has to, we have to consider on one side, the freedom of religion, and on the other side, the public, the interest of the entire society. So mm -hmm. there was a tension, but she, she didn't give an, uh, an, answer, an answer, but she, she just raised uh, the question. That's why it was interesting uh, interested for my, uh, for my presentation. Mm, thank you. So finally, to conclude uh, my presentation, uh, in conclusion, um, I just want to go back. In my presentation, where my, aim, my, uh, my objective was, to, was just to, to show that synagogues uh, are uh, uh, encapsulate a bundle of issues because they are, they are both central to the daily life of Hasidic communities and visible to the non-Hasidic residents. I try to explain that synagogues have to be analyzed with three aspects in mind. First, there are key elements in the process of institutional completeness for the Hasidic communities. Second, they are an issue of zoning for Outremont and Le Plateau Mont Royal because the synagogue challenge the dominant conception of what, what a place of worship is. Finally, synagogues have consequences on the daily life of non hasidic residents. Finally, these three levels reflect the fact that synagogues are opportunities for talking between members of the different communities so that if the synagogues are the subject of controversies, they can also give rise to exchanges and discussions in the years to come. And I will finish my presentation on this, on this conclusion, and we have plenty of time for questions and comments. Perfect. Well, thank you very much, um, Monsieur Dejan. It was a real pleasure to hear all those details. 
Um, I just want to remind everyone that tonight we had the chance to hear uh, the research of Mr. D. I'm never sure if I should say Mr. or Monsieur. <laughs> so it's okay if I call you Mr. Um, Dejan, it's okay. Yes. Um, so thank you for your sharing your research. I just want to reframe that tonight it's not a debate. We will take questions from this point. So if there's any quote that you heard in French you would like to hear, we can give our best to translate this in English for you. Uh, if you need anything to be um, answered in more detail, it will be a pleasure for us to do that. I will just um, share my screen for a second. I will stop uh, your sharing for one minute just to share one more time uh, the presentation and the context um, and the, the rules we would like everyone to use for uh, those questions. So you should be seeing my screen right now. Um, Marie-Claude, yes, you're seeing my screen. Perfect. So raise your hand, your virtual hand. If you don't know where this one is, okay. it's in uh, the reaction button. Uh, if it doesn't work, you can at some point um, also raise your real hand and we will understand that you have a question. We will invite you to ask one question at the time if ever you have many, and we will try to keep them short around two minutes. Uh, just because we want everyone to be brief so we can take the advantage of hearing everyone's question. Um, we also want to uh, make sure that we stay open to differences. We speak calmly and uh, respectfully in terms that we remember that this is uh, the clarification question you might have. Uh, and we want to give you this uh, opportunity, but it's not a platform tonight where we want to express our opinion. So that would not be the right place, but we would like to answer any uh, precision you need, any translation you need. Um, so it's really in this uh, context, we want you to be clear uh, with your question. Uh, I also want to remind you uh, to, uh, if you want to rename yourself, if you are able to do that, where you see your camera, there's three little dots. If you click on those three little dots, uh, you will have the opportunity to say rename. Um, and then when you click on rename, if, for example, right now you are um, MD or I see um, some LO or uh, 9178. <laughs> so uh, if you can, please change your name. If not, I will just invite you with what is written uh, as your name and we will invite you to say your real name so we can uh, we can hear it. So voila, I will go look in the chat to see if we have some questions. So we had some question and, and then I will give um, Mr. Poulain or Madame Poulain um, the opportunity to ask their question. Um, and we had Diane Shea that asked um, a question before and Marie-Claude answered it. Um, so the question was about the zoning uh, by law. So what exactly is the zoning by law and what does it say? And Marie-Claude gave uh, some link uh, for the zoning in Outremont and also for the graphic representation of the Outremont uh, zoning by law. Um, I don't know if that really answered your question, uh, Diane Shea. If not, please raise your hand and we will make sure to clarify if you need um, anything else. Um, that's okay, yes. I, I was wondering specifically what was in the bylaw that was problematic, but I'll go back and look at it. Yeah. Okay, maybe uh, Monsieur Desjean would like to add anything on that or? Yeah, but ba basically, uh, you can hear me. Basically, yes. what the the the, um, the comp what we heard uh, during the interviews was specifically for Outremont because uh, if you if you just consider the bylaw in Outremont, uh, uh, you it's technically it's very difficult to find a place to open a new place of worship. And I'm not talking exclusively about uh, synagogues, but just if you want to open a place of worship, there is no place uh, available. Just because you have a very strong density, a very high density in Outremont, and that it's not like some other borough in Montreal where you have uh, big uh, commercial arteries, you have industrial areas, where the borough decided to locate the new places of worship. So that's why there is something problematic for some, some of the communities. And in the, in the future, 
probably the Bureau will have to think of what can we do to address uh, this, uh, this issue of the non-availability of new spaces for places of worship. Okay, thank you for that answer. There's another question that was asked by uh, Hello in the chat. Um, Hello is asking, how can I get the research study and the report? And again, Marie-Claude Leblanc uh, placed the report uh, link. So if you would like to see uh, the executive summary of the report, uh, you can go and click on this link uh, to access it. And I will encourage you to do that before we end uh, that conversation tonight at nine o'clock, just so to make sure that you have access to it. Um, and now we have a person uh, named Poulet. Monsieur, Madame uh, Poulet, I will invite you to open your microphone and please ask your question. Oui, c'est Marc Poulet. Uh, Monsieur Dejean, I read your study and the element that I didn't find in it is because you, you established that based on the surveys and, and your survey of how many places of worship and slash community centers have already been established in the borough, but you clearly established in your uh, study that there were a need for more. Uh, the question is how many more uh, would be necessary to, uh, according to your study, uh, to uh, fulfill the demand? Thank you for your question, <laughs> Mark uh, Frankly, I have to tell you that I don't have uh, the answer to this question because we, to give an answer to this question, we, we should make uh, an, um, a, a survey to with all uh, the communities in Outremont, but uh, probably the only thing I can say is uh, in the future, uh, one of the issue will be to that the new places of worship have to follow the evolution of where uh, Hasidic communities uh, and members are located. As I explained in the, in the presentation and some of the leaders we met during the research explained to us that uh, traditionally uh, uh, Hasidic, Hasidic community members were located uh, between Jeanne Mans and uh, Du Rocher, Kerb and um, Atchison. But now we can see that there is an evolution uh, toward the, the, the west uh, of the borough. So probably there will be a need for, uh, for new synagogues in this part of the, of the borough. But I, I won't be able to tell you uh, precisely if there is a need for one, two, three synagogues. But probably, in, and I think I forgot in the pre presentation to say that Finally, what I discovered in the research was that uh, the most important element is not the demographic growth. I think that one of the key elements is more the, um, the institutional fragmentation between the communities and even the little communities uh, need an access to space and are looking for premises where to open. So it's, we, we can consider the, the, the growth of the acidic population, but it's not the only element to take into account to, to, to assess uh, the, the, the situation. Uh, can I follow up on, uh, on my point then? Uh, well, first, I think it's, the, you know, it's unfortunate that the study didn't address that element because it's clearly within the mandate you've been given if we want to urban plan the city to understand what are the needs and uh, so so in that regard uh, i think i would have preferred uh, your point of view on this than the point of view on the uh, uh, legal point of view or uh, you know which i can get by the lawyer but from you i can only get uh, that uh, you're the the one who, who can um, establish uh, this because that's you're an expert in the field. So in that regard, I think uh, it's it's a miss in the studies. Uh, the second element, though, uh, 
um, so Mr. Poulain, if you don't mind, I will just have to stop you because I want to remind you that tonight we're not here to give opinion, but more to ask questions. I but just want to make sure. It's, it's exactly what I'm doing, madam. I'm, I'm asking yes. questions to the expert yeah, you did. You and did trying, answer. we did a study on yeah. this situation. It's not an opinion. I'm asking okay. in his mind, after doing the study, talking yeah. to all the communities, in, uh, acidic communities in Outremont, including how many new communities have established in the last few years, yeah. that calls for how many more synagogues. That's, I think that's okay. a legitimate yeah, question. It, it, it's it not was an perfect. Opinion. It was perfect. I, 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 I just want to give the chance for, I will just give the chance to Monsieur Poulain, if you don't mind, if there's any other questions, we ask to ask one at the time. Uh, and I want to make sure we have the time to hear everyone. So your question was perfect. Thank you. Um, and maybe you'll have the chance to ask another question if you want. I just want to make sure we give the chance to everyone. Uh, please raise your hand again if you have a question. Uh, if you're not able to raise your virtual hand, we can also take real hand. Um, so, and then I'll come back uh, to Marc Poulain if we don't have any other questions. So we're here to um, hear clarification if we need on the presentation of tonight. And we understand that these are sensitive, right? Maybe you have your own emotional state about uh, the situation and preferences and things you would um, like or prefer. Uh, but we just want to remind each other that we are here uh, for uh, precision on the research um, and anything, maybe some people need translation or anything about uh, that was not well understood. I don't see any uh, reaction. Uh, yes, Zian Shi. Please open your microphone. Well, if, uh, I don't want to take all the time, but if nobody else has their we'll hand. rotate, right? We want to give the chance to everyone. yeah. So uh, I could ask it, I really appreciate that point uh, about how we look at synagogues and other places of worship, you know, from the Christian point of view. So we see a big church in Outremont and for, so it's that Christian idea of a church that we think of. And uh, do you, I wanted to ask you, uh, you know, this, uh, some of the controversy, like uh, on Bernard Street, I think these misconceptions really contribute to that, because people think there's going to be a big building that's going to take all that space and take over the street. And then we find out if you really ask questions, it's going to be some teeny tiny place that won't even barely be visible from the street at all. So these miscommunications and the lack of understanding because of that, like you put it, a Christian view of what is a place of worship. Do you think that contributes to some of the tension? Yeah, be, well, so the, 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 the mandate was not, clearly was not about the, 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 the tension or uh, an analysis of what was happening in, in Outremont uh, uh, on this topic, but I think that what um, if I if I uh, tonight if I spoke about what we call multicultural planning is that uh, this field of research in urban planning um, uh, bring a brings um, a very important point, uh, which is how we consider what uh, a religious place uh, a place of worship should be and uh, what uh, are we ready to, to accept as a society, uh, as a, a legitimate uh, expect, uh, expectation from uh, religious minorities uh, in Quebec and in Montreal. And that's something important because uh, during many years, Montreal, uh, the city of Montreal, not only the borough of Outremont or Plateau Mont-Royal, uh, didn't realize that uh, uh, religious premises and places of worship uh, was an issue for the city. Because you probably know that there was uh, the idea that uh, in, with the process of secularization, uh, because um, uh, the, the Catholic uh, were less visible and less important in the society, uh, religious was something uh, 
that will be disappearing in the future. And now we realize that there are new religious minorities and these religious minorities uh, have expectations and they have expectation and they have uh, religious practices that do not fit with the conception of a uh, place of worship uh, and the conception of the, the religious activities. And I, I didn't precise in my presentation that uh, from the perspective of, uh, of a borough uh, of the city of Montreal, Montreal, there is no definition of what, what religion is. So some boroughs have a definition of, of what a place of worship is. A place of worship is, is mainly for religious activities. But the problem is that nobody knows exactly what a religious activity is. Uh, so I think that it's probably a source of the tension because um, I know that some of the leaders I met for the, uh, for the, for, for the study explained to me that from their perspective, uh, it's not mine, uh, but from their perspective, they do not have the choice to uh, uh, not to respect the, 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 the bylaw uh, because uh, the bylaw, uh, bylaw do not fit with the realities of what is happening in the synagogues on a daily basis. Okay, thank you, um, Diancha, for your question. We have a question in the chat, and I would like to invite Marie Claude Leblanc uh, to give an answer. There is already a part of an answer in the chat. So there's hello, <laughs> I don't know your real name, I'm sorry, um, that ask uh, first what happened after, the, after uh, this study. And then there is a mayor that ask, uh, now that we have the study that shows the need. Um, is there an increase? Um, what are the borrow's next step? And Marie-Claude answered that the table of concertation, bon voisinage, will make recommendation to the borrow council. Uh, but I think we would like maybe to have a bit more details on that, Marie-Claude, if you can uh, help us. Thank you. I'll try my best. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I don't think I have a, a good translation for the for the term. So sorry in advance, mm -hmm. uh, but that uh, uh, space of consultation can we say that in English? I hope so. Um, it was uh, launched last year with four people from the Acidic community communities and uh, four people from non Acidic communities to come together and uh, discuss. Uh, issues and find solutions or uh, recommendations for the borough uh, to act, uh, to take them and then uh, act on them. Uh, so uh, that's that's the the spirit of that uh, uh, consultation table on uh, good neighborhood. I don't know if, if we can say that, but we prefer to keep it in French. So it's, uh, uh, it's not lost in translation, but I hope it was uh, okay for uh, Monsieur Mayor. And maybe Marie-Claude, if you don't mind to uh, explain the context of, because uh, I think that you, the bar request for that study, someone is asking, um, do we do studies before opening a restaurant? What is the context for that study? Do you mind to explain that? No problem. It was to give uh, uh, studies for the, the table de concertation de bon voisinage to reflect on, to give them perspective. Um, so it was really the, the, the goal of uh, the two studies, uh, the one from Monsieur Dejean and the other one uh, from uh, Madame Gadi. Perfect. Thank you very much. Uh, so Bon Voisinage, it's good neighborhood relations round table, but we're not sure it's the perfect translation, but that should sound like this. Uh, we have a question from Sam Muller. Uh, I don't forget you, Marc Poulain. I just want to make sure we give a first round to everyone and then I'll come back to you. Uh, Sam Muller, would you like to ask your question? Make sure you open your mic. Yes, thank you. Yes, hello, good evening. Uh, first of all, thank you uh, for the borrow and for uh, the professor for doing this presentation in English. So members of the community and English speaking members of the borough can understand the study. My question is basically, um, 
how do we categorize a place of worship? When does a place become a place of worship? If I have a meeting in my house or a party or we do something with friends and we decide to do the evening prayer before or after, does my house become an illegal place of worship? No, 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 no. He said no. <laughs> but no, you, you answer for the <laughs> Mr. Deja. You can do what you... I, 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 I remember that uh, uh, someone compared the, the prayer with uh, how we meet sometimes just, you know, for instance, when, the, when there is a Super Bowl on the TV and that you invite all your friends to your place and you share a beer and pizza and it doesn't mean that you're your house become automatically a restaurant. That's, uh, that's sure. So you, you can, in fact, and uh, um, I, I'm not, I, I do not work for the, for the borough of Outremont, but one, uh, 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 one of the um, a civil servant of Outremont told me, and I think he was right, that uh, the problem is not if you invite some friends one or two times during the year and you want to pray together, you totally have the right to, 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 to do that. You're entitled to, to do that. But the problem happens if you organize a prayer every week for some of your friends and some you, and if you move the furniture in your, in your place, and if you made some new arrangement for, and that uh, a little bit by little bit, your house uh, become more a place of worship and not only a, a, a residence. And for, for instance, when the, the, there is, a, an, the, there is a, a, an issue uh, which is not only for Outremont and Le Plateau Mont Royal, but when you have an inspector working for the urban planning department in every borough of the city of Montreal, sometimes they have to assess if uh, when they enter a place, when they visit a place, they have to, to decide if this place is still her house or is it something else? And then they have to determine what is this, this something, okay? So if you want to, uh, to invite some people and you want to pray together, uh, you are totally free to, to do it. But af after that, there is sometimes you can have complaint from your, from, from your neighbors because they, 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 heard, they hear some noises, some music, but exactly as if you organize a party and some, some people will call the police. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you for your answer, um, Mr. Dejean. Thank you for your question, Samuelar. Um, so I will come back to, um, I will come back to Marc Poulain. I just want to remind everyone there's new people that just arrived uh, in this conversation. So we heard a great presentation from uh, Monsieur Desjean and we're here to ask for questions <coughs> and making sure we understand uh, all the details of the presentation. Um, so Marc Poulain, I think you have uh, another question maybe you would like to ask. Well, yeah, I'm just following up on the first question. So thank you. What would be necessary as a uh, as a complement to this study to address the question of how many would be required uh, uh, not only in numbers but based on your first answer Mr. Dejean I suspect also from a geography perspective if we take into account the uh, uh, what you just said so what would be the follow-up because from an urban planning perspective, you truly understand that we need to establish uh, the need uh, to be able to zone appropriately. The same reason why there are studies to determine the number of restaurants that can live on the commercial artery. Uh, and there's limit to the number of restaurants that can open and there's limit to all kinds of institutions on a commercial uh, artery because uh, so, so in that respect, uh, what would be uh, the follow-up to the study to be able to come up to, uh, to numbers? Okay. Thank you. Um, yeah. um, I would say that if we were looking for uh, a precise number, if we wanted to, to answer the, the question of how many places of worship uh, uh, have, to be, uh, have to be open, um, I think we will have to make uh, uh, 
a, a study in which we, we would assess all the communities, all the Hasidic communities in Outremont and Le Plateau Montréal. But unfortunately, that was not the scope of the research uh, because for the research, we did not interview and for, uh, for different reasons, but we did not interview all uh, representatives of all the synagogue and Outremont. We made interviews with 10 representatives and uh, some uh, leaders of the communities. That's my, the first point. Uh, my second point is just to tell that I don't know if it's the, um, the responsibility of the borough to, to arrive with a number of uh, places of worship needed by the Hasidic communities. But because maybe you will give a number and two or three years later, uh, your number will be outdated. Uh, I think that the Bravo don't, and that's something important. I, I, I really appreciate your, your, your question and your concern, uh, your concern on this point, but the Bravo do not have, uh, in a legal perspective, the, the Bravo do not have to find premises for every community who is looking for a place of worship. The borough have to, to, to offer some, possi some possibilities, but maybe one day there will be no place, no other place available. And at this moment, they will have to, to, to open the discussion on the, on the, um, on the, the, the different uh, streets or arteries where you can open uh, where you can open a place, of, where you can open a place of worship. Thank you. I see some comment in the chat. Um, I will try to capture them, but I don't see a clear uh, question. So as we kept on uh, saying that we want people to ask questions. Um, so there's a, there's some comment about um, should it be the barrel that determine uh, just like they were able to determine restaurant in all the example um, that you mentioned, uh, Frédéric. Uh, and then also there's a correction, someone saying um, that there is no limit in the borrow on how many restaurants can open. It doesn't exist. And there's no clear question here. And then um, the, there's ML that says that democratic study, um, the community paid and gave the borrow is a good guidance. But in no way does a borrow uh, put a hard number on anything. So these are more on a conversation mode. So I want to invite you again to uh, raise your hand if you have uh, questions or write it uh, in the chat in the form of a question. And we still have some time to take uh, some more questions. Marc Poulain, if ever you have other questions, uh, you can keep your hands up and uh, we will also give it some time. Um, so do we have any other question? If you don't want to write them in the chat or you don't know where the virtual hands are, you can raise your real hand and we will uh, see it if you can open uh, your question. So we have a question from S. Mayer in the chat. Uh, my question is why the question of Monsieur Poulain makes it through the doors when um, it is a challenging the study rather than trying to understand uh, it's a question with the intention of um, discrediting a credible and important study. Well, uh, I think I'll answer to this because uh, that, that uh, first, I don't think you should have read that comment because it's uh, clearly an attack, personal attack on the, on the question I've raised and it's a question of opinion. So first, uh, I think, uh, you know, uh, if you said you, uh, well, push me aside earlier in the discussion saying that I had an opinion, this is a lot worse. Uh, so that's your role as an arbitrator. But uh, to explain is that if we want to do urban planning, you need to understand the needs. In a city, you determine that there's such a, a commercial uh, area and it's going to be of that size based on the need for commercial activities within the city. You're going to determine that there is a need for X many parks in, in, in the borough based on the needs uh, uh, according. So 
places of worship are a utilization of space. From an urbanas urbanistic point of view, this utilization of space has got to be limited, cannot be infinite because mm -hmm. uh, we cannot, you know, I'm sure nobody would agree that uh, we would have uh, a, a street full of Orthodox churches uh, based on the fact that there would be, uh, uh, you know, X many Orthodox churches that once established in a given spot, even if there were not enough Mm -hmm. people to occupy those churches so it's the same story it's, it's the question that we need to balance the need with the space available and to understand that balance it's uh, uh it's necessary mm -hmm. to get a better handle on the need I, i'm not i'm not Thank discrediting you. mr uh the Jean study i'm just saying it's yes. not going far enough in a sense that we don't have that number and to be honest when i read the mandate i was expecting that number but so that's hence my second question is that what we need to do further mm -hmm. to understand the need and how can we go about it because uh without this uh we cannot do proper urban planning that's my point of view thank you Marc Poulain, for for your precision uh, and I want to remind everyone, even the people in the chat, please keep it uh, respectful and calm. We're here to ask questions, precision on the study. Uh, even if we live a strong emotion on one side or the other, um, please keep it uh, nice and respectful in the chat or in your comment. Um, we I don't know, uh, Monsieur Desjean, if you want to add anything, there's another, um, would you like to react to that comment? Or a question. Yeah. <laughs> I just want to precise that. Yes. Uh, in fact, I I appreciate what because um, uh, as a uh, uh, um, as an academic, I consider that my my work, my study, have to be challenged. So I have no problem if people consider that the study do not go f do not go far enough. That we have to go further, and I'm totally agree with that but my 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 understanding how i understood the mandate was not to find a clear number because i think I, i'm not sure if even if it's possible to find you can just as i as i said even if we we had a very precise a map of the situation uh, and if we made interviews with all the communities we can imagine that one or two years after that, th these numbers uh, will be outdated and won't mm -hmm. fit with the current situation. That that's why that my that's my perspective that the the borough have to think not of how many synagogues, but what can we do just to give possibilities for other synagogues, different models of synagogues. That's how the borough, and it's my just my point of view, have to has to work. And but I'm not sure that we can just say we the Hasidic communities need ten new synagogues. It doesn't make sense. That's mm -hmm. that's what I understood. Thank you. Uh, we have Diane Shah with a question. If you don't don't mind, just before I would like to read uh, one comment from S. Mayer in the chat. Um, any answer or comment on uh, Monsieur Poulain? I agree that the, the needs to be determined, but the study uh, purpose was just to evaluate uh, whether there's a need or not. Uh, and now it's the job of the borough to determine all the rest. But if we go back to the comment of Marie-Claude Leblanc, it will, it will be more the role of the committee, uh, table de concertation, uh, bon voisinage. Um, I will go look for the translation again. Good Neighborhood um, Relations Roundtable, uh, they will uh, come back with a recommendation to the Borough Council. So thank you for that. Uh, I will go to Diane Shah, and I, I want to remind you that we're here to uh, go and um, dig into the uh, research and ask question and precision on that research. Um, so Diane Shah, and we have uh, still a couple of minutes in front of us to do that. 
Remember to open your mic just on the bottom left. Yes. Yeah. Thank you. Sorry. Yes, I'm wondering what uh, we're talking about the problem uh, with the zoning bylaw not uh, being able to address uh, the issues. So I'm wondering what would be the best zoning tool for the borough to use. And I'm also curious to know, uh, our mayor is here. I'm curious to know what the mayor of Outremont would think the best zoning tool would be or what he thinks about the study in general. But um, okay, thank you. Um, Monsieur Dejan, would you like to answer to that? No, no, oh, I'm not the mayor. <laughs> no. uh, well, I don't know um, if the mayor wants to speak, but I want to reframe that we're here to answer questions and things that we'd like to. Um, we would like well, to. Ask. The the zoning tool is very important like what is the zoning tool we can use uh -huh, uh -huh. Yeah. so under the, the zoning tool okay um so again this is not the the place here tonight to hear on um the mayor but we will take that note of that question and we will be able to answer it uh later on so i want to reframe again that we want to go deeper maybe in the study anything yes um uh, yeah, just um Two years ago, I made a research for the city of Montreal. So it was not only, it was not for a borough, but it was an assessment of how the 19 boroughs of Montreal are dealing with the issue of places of worship. And in this study, we analyze all the tools available in planning and the different bylaw that the borough are, are currently using and how they are dealing with places of worship. But because it's not, it's not only a question of tools, because the question is not what are the tools you, you have? The question is, what are you doing with these tools? Because with this, we see that in the different borough of Montreal, you have exactly the same tools, but the results are totally different. Mm -hmm. So the question is not what are the tools? The question is more what the people want to do with these tools. And it's a political issue and it's not a scientific, unfortunately, it's not a scientific one. I'd like to bring a, 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 an answer, but uh, it's more mm -hmm. political. Thank you. And maybe you have, um, maybe you can also add some precision because Usher is asking, is there any limit or restriction uh, or any commercial or industrial enterprise like restaurant or grocery, et cetera? And if not, he's asking, uh, why are places of wor uh, worship different? I don't know if this is something that um, that you can answer. Uh, th there is a word in French, which is contingentement. I don't know the, the translation in English. Mm, let me see. <laughs> but Contingency? Or containment, I'm not sure. Contain no, it's not containment. No. But in fact, the idea is, for instance, I know that some borough of Montreal, for instance, uh, the Sud-Ouest, few years ago, they modified the bylaw because on the Avenue Monk, new places of worship opened. It was not Jewish synagogues. It was uh, mostly uh, evangelical churches uh, opened uh, directly on the street on the first floor. And they decided just to modify the, the bylaw and they use the way of the contingentment. So now there is, there is I, I don't have the, the, the number in mind, I, 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 um, but they limit the number of places of worship opening on the street because what they, wanted, what they wanted to avoid was to, you know, having a, like four or five places of worship uh, directly the one after the other. So they wanted to preserve the commercial, um, the commercial aspect of the commercial continuum, uh, continuum commercial, the commercial continuum on the street. The, the, it is a tool and the tool exists, but some borough decides to use, use its tool. Some other borough don't want to use it. So one time again, it's something which is political. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Monsieur Dejan. And um, there's Valentina Gatti that suggests maybe for contingent, contingentment, uh, something like quota, maybe. Could, uh, 
Yeah, could be a good translation. So I want to remind everyone that uh, you have the opportunity to ask questions uh, to Monsieur Dejean to see if there is anything you would like to know in more depth uh, in the presentation uh, of tonight. You can write your question in the chat. Uh, you can also raise your hand. Um, Marc Poulin, you still have your hands up. Do you have a different yep, question? I still have a question for Mr. Dejean. Yes. Uh, yeah, obviously that's, you know, just to reflect on what you just said, that's the uh, this contingentement or is the reason for the uh, current uh, bylaw that was uh, established a number of years ago in the borough. My question is a little bit more different. Uh, from your study, Mr. Dejean, I gather it's more a question of number than a question of size. So for example, I, I gather that the need you uh, seem to have established is more for new, new uh, synagogue slash community centers rather than expanding the current ones, uh, 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 which obviously has different urban uh, planning uh, uh, consequences. Am I correct that you, that uh, did I read your study properly? Uh, yeah, 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 it's true. And uh, in fact, I think there are two trends because there is a need for the 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 biggest synagogues there is a need for them to to expand because as you probably know for some holidays for instance for shabbat all the community have to gather in this place of worship but there is there is also a need for a smaller prayer room which is they are not exactly place of worship it's not like it's more like prayer room and this pray, prayer room uh, could be used on a daily basis, basis for the members of a community. So, and, and you, you, your comment is true because as um, uh, a borough or a city or municipality uh, don't have to, to, just have to deal with urban consequences of a place and they don't have to give, uh, uh, they don't have to, to, uh, to, um, they don't have to 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 give their perspective on the the way this place is used but it's more on the urban consequences and what we realize that some synagogues have big effects of big consequences on the neighborhood but other little prayer room could have uh, small consequences because the people will just come uh, walking from their from the from, from their residence or the there, there will be just maybe uh, 20, 25 uh, in the prayer room. So the consequences will be completely different. So is the priority on size or the priority on number if you had to select one? I, I would say on number. Because as I, as I told in the presentation, the, the, the open, because in the, in the interview, some people, said, okay, because Avenue du Parc is probably a very convenient street where we could open new synagogues and everybody would, would agree with this solution, uh, especially between Bernard and Van Horn, uh, which is a part of the avenue, which is not, uh, which is not valorized uh, where the, because there is a bridge at the end of the, of the street. Uh, but other people tell me that, uh, it's not the solution because the, the, the synagogues have to, the, the locations of the different synagogues have to reflect the geography of the members of the communities. And what we observe, and I think it could be a, a very interesting research for the future, is that there is a, a move, a shift uh, toward, uh, to, to, toward the, the west uh, uh, of the borough. Uh, that's why probably in the, in, the, in the future, there will be needs for new synagogues in the west uh, uh, of the borough. Well, you know, that's la poule <laughs> you know, <laughs> If I want to live close by to a grocery store and there's no zoning for a grocery store, I'm not going to be able to request a grocery store because of it. So if there are spaces, but they don't seem to... Uh, you know, we agree. It's kind of 
it's la poule ou l'oeuf, which decides mm -hmm. which, uh, and uh, uh, it's, I guess that's mm -hmm. going to be the, 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 the question for the, the city and the borough, because in this case, I think the complexity is also the fact that uh, Avenue du Parc is in another borough versus Outremont, so it creates mm -hmm. uh, a little bit more political issues, but uh, the you, argument Marilyn. that we, uh, that um, uh, the, the, the use of space should be the, the should sh should be moved because populations are moving. Thank you. Uh, it, it's a it, 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 it's a good question, uh, but it's it, it, it's a political. That's one that needs to be answered politically, because I, as I said, it's a full left. Thank you, Marc Poulain. Um, we just have a couple of minutes left. Um, we have a couple of comments in the chat. I would also uh, like to invite Marie-Claude just to remind us uh, what we have next week uh, coming okay. up. Um, so I can just uh, maybe let Marie-Claude uh, answer or present us what's coming next week. Um, and uh, just to say, there's ML in the chat uh, that comments that, uh, just to remind that Park Avenue is not Outremont. And then there is Usher that says a quota to limit the numbers on the street is one thing, but having places of worship of limits on certain street uh, where other commercial stores are allowed in a different story. I'm not sure there's a question here. Is there any ah, is there any similar restriction with restaurant or grocery? We're a bit back to the previous question we had earlier on uh, today. Um, anything you would like to ask, uh, Monsieur? Oui, yes, Monsieur Desjean. Just because I think that the command that just to remind Park Avenue is not in Outremont, it's, it's important, but it just illustrates there is something uh, weird that uh, when we are talking about uh, urban planning, especially for religious activities, the, the, every, the borough, so the borough have to respect some uh, general overarching, overarching uh, uh, norms and, uh, and principles in, in Montreal, but uh, the issue of religious zoning uh, should be, um, uh, sh should be uh, uh, to take into consideration by the two borough together. And I was a little bit surprised because when I, when I, I did the, because the mandate, uh, the research, and the idea of the research came from Outremont. But when you, when you look at the numbers of synagogues, you realize that the, the issue is not an Outremont issue, it's more a Le Plateau Mont Royal issue. But why it's not, it, do, it doesn't appear like a problem, a public problem in, in, Le, Pla, in Le Plateau Mont Royal. And I don't know why, but I never received a reaction from the Plateau Mont Royal after I, I gave the, the report and I sent them the, the, the report. But my point is just that when you consider the religious zoning, uh, it's not only an issue for one borough and another problem for another borough. The borough have to, to work together on this, uh, 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 on this topic, I think. Mm -hmm. It was a very rich uh, discussion, uh, Monsieur Desjean. Thank you very much. Um, maybe Marie-Claude, if you just want to present us what's coming next week and we see if we have a couple of more minutes, I see uh, Diancha still have a question. Uh, do I have, do I do my, my teaser before or after? I will, maybe we could wait Please in go. the conclusion. Okay, uh, um, next week we will have uh, Madame Gadzi that will present uh, her research and it will be bilingual. Uh, so I hope that you will uh, and be there to to hear what she she has to say i'm sure it will be a great presentation thank you very much so we uh, have uh, madame leblanc you're clearly not in advertising because uh, next week uh, what day what what time <laughs> <laughs> sunday 7 to 9 thank you Marc Poulain, for uh, the question so same uh, time uh, different link but uh, so next Sunday, 7 to 9, how we can get the link, uh, Marie-Claude Leblanc? I, I will put it in the, in the chat with the time. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Diancha, maybe one very quick uh, last question. We have uh, six minutes left. 
Uh, thank you. Just uh, addressing um, what Monsieur Dejean just said. In your research, uh, did you find in all the interviews why there seems to be more tension in Outremont and less tension, even though there's so many more synagogues in my land? Uh, it was not exactly, I think it was not the, 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 the mandate and it was not the the, the the topic of the research, but you have different research in the past years. We try to understand why uh, why there were so many affairs in Outremont and controversies concerning the, the synagogues. And I think, uh, but I'm not a specialist at this point, that one of the, maybe just uh, uh, an answer is, it's just that the population is very different in uh, Outremont and the Myland. And it's not something new because in 19, uh, probably you, you probably know the very famous documentary um, realized uh, 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 in uh, 1998, uh, uh, um, uh, Bonjour Shalom, which is a very famous documentary. And in this documentary, uh, someone explained that in Outremont, uh, Outremont is like a, um, uh, is like an iconic borough for uh, French speaking French speaking uh, bourgeoisie, and probably that uh, there is a capacity capacity to mobilize uh, in Outremont that do not exist uh, in, uh, in in the mainland, and and I think that with there is another, uh, another thing that uh, most of the, a lot of the, even if the synagogues are now uh, on Park Avenue, the people who, who attend these synagogues live in majority in, uh, in Outremont. That's probably one of the, the way to, to understand the, the, the situation. Thank you for that great question. Um, thank you, Frédéric uh, Desjean. It was very interesting. Uh, Marie-Claude Leblanc just put in the chat the link for next week with the official title in English. Uh, I put previously the title in French. It's going to be a bilingual presentation. You have the link. So we really want to thank you all for your great questions. Thank you for your presence. Thank you for your comments. Uh, it was really nice to, um, to be here with you tonight. And uh, we hope to see you next week. And don't be shy to ask questions. Uh, thank you a lot. Thank you, uh, Valérie, and see you next uh, Sunday. Uh, thank you, everyone. And we we'll see you next week. Bye bye. Merci encore. Thank you, Frédéric Desjean. And thank you, all of you, for your great questions.